ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدي وحبيبي ونور حبيبي وكمال طعامي وللجنود أدوائنا وعافية أبدائنا وشفائها ونور الأبصار وضياءنا أبو القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المحسنين الهاديين المهديين الذين هب الله عنهم الرزا وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد صلى الله عليك يا رسول السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأمر مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى cousins, nephews, neighbors, everybody's happy. But you can notice there is one person who's not happy. Even though everybody's happy, but one person among all the of everybody is not happy. You know who that person is? The baby himself or herself. <laughs> As everybody's smiling, he or she is crying. Allah. Why? There's a reason behind it. 
But that's not the point. The point is this beginning, everybody is happy about it. Except the baby, because it's the beginning. And we're all looking up to that. We write it on the calendar. We are all looking up to it. My birthday, the day I was born. It's a great day in our life. But we never think about the last day of our lives. How will my last be? And you know Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He left one legacy for all of us. And he said, he said, every one of us should take one message. And this should be the take home message tonight, inshallah, as we are commemorating this great event of Imam Hussein. Let's be, let this be our take home message from Imam. What did Imam say? He said, as we mentioned that every one of us, we come into this world and everyone around us is happy, except us. He said, reverse it on the day you depart from this world. How do you reverse it? You know, when somebody is dying, let everybody is crying and you be the one smiling. You can reverse it. The way you came, let it be opposite of the day you depart from this world. Right? Now, this is the message that Imam Hussein alayhi salam talks about the importance of a happy ending the day we depart from this world. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad It is very important that every one of us think about the last day of my life. How would it be? In that sense, because one of the teachings of Imam Hussein, one of the lessons of Karbala, is that Imam Hussein taught us that there are two groups of people. Some people, they start good and they end good. Some people, they start good, but they end bad. But the question is, which group are you and I going to be in? The one who starts with good and end good, or the one who starts with good and end bad? Right? And because of this, and because this is very important, when you go to our Imam, Imam Zayn al-Abidin, Salaamu Allah Alayhi, in his book, which is known, Sahib al sajjadiyya he has one dua out of all those dua. It's called dua al-husnul aqibah. Dua of asking Allah to have a good ending. And before to, for us to understand the importance of this, let me take you to the Quran. And I'm going to share with you a story from the Quran so we can take a message from this, from this story. Because when we talk about story, a lot of us, we think story is about something funny, something to smile, something to be happy about, but not taking a lesson from it. No, that's not the point. And Quran, when Allah tells you a story, Allah wants us to learn something from that story. Take a message, take a lesson from that story. One of the stories of the Quran about the importance of a good ending of your life is in Surah Al-Hashr. Allah talks about one of the men of Bani Israel who happened to be one of the followers of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Very, very pious man. To the point, after Musa alayhi salam, people used to come to him for dua. You have any need, you go to him, he raises his hand, he makes dua, Allah gives you whatever you ask for. People are sick. Don't we go to zero asking Allah for cure, treatment? At the time of this man, people used to go to him for treatment. And anytime he asked Allah, that said is done. In other words, you can say he was like al Messiah at this time. That no problem ever been brought to him and he would not be able to solve that problem. Now look at how Allah wants to test him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, by a lady who was sick and she had mental problem. The family of the sister decided to take her to him so that he can make dua for her treatment. They brought the sister to him and he said to the brothers, can you leave her to make dua and ask Allah for her treatment? Come a few days later after. 
They left the sister with him, hoping for the best, that inshallah by the time they come, the sister will be better. The family left, and the brother, or the alim, or the pious man, he had the sister in his house, praying for a pastor's recovery. Days passed by, and you know shaitan, nobody is safe from shaitan. Nobody. Until you get to the cruise level. If you don't get the cruise level, oh, shaitan is still gonna tempt you. Right? The cruise level is the level of an isma. When you reach that level, that's it. Shaitan cannot mess with you. Now, this man is not masoom. So shaitan came in and he started playing with his mind. Right? What happened? Shaitan overcome him. What happened? He killed the sister. And he buried her in his own room. Then the same shaitan <coughs> goes out in the form of human, meet him with the, with the brothers of the sister. When he met them, shaitan said to them, How is your sister? Did you check on your sister? Do you know she's alive? She's okay? Then the brother said, of course, we know our sister is fine, he's in good heaven. The alim is a pious, God worried, very. He's good, and she's good. The shaitan told them, no, you should go and check on your sister. I don't think your sister is okay. Look at how shaitan played double standard. After that, shaitan insists to them, go and check your sister. They said, okay. They went to this alim, this pious man, they knocked the door. And the alim, his name is not mentioned in the Quran, but in the history or in tafsir, they say his name was Barsisiya from the Bani Israel. They knocked the door. Ya Barsisiya, we came to check on our sister. He said, okay. Can you go and come back later? He said, okay. He went home. He came later. He said, no, can you come tomorrow? Okay. They couldn't see their sister, they went home. They came back the next day. Where's our sister? They said, no, go back and come the next day. They said, no, we want to see our sister. We came yesterday. You sent us back for twice. And you told us to come today. We came today, we want to see our sister. Is she alive? Is she okay? Is she dead? Is she sick? They said, no, go and come back. They said, no, we want to see our sister. They insisted. But since you found out, there is no way unfold unless you tell them the truth. He said, your sister is poor. Where is she? And she said, she's very here in my home. Allah. They left the home and they found her to kill her. They said, okay. The brothers decided they're going to take him to court. So that they can get justice. They went to the court. What the court says, we have to proceed, we have to prosecute him. What happened? They finally found him guilty. Barsisir, an alim who was respected in the community, in the society, which everybody comes to him for dua, for anything. Now he is now being put in front of the court. Allahu Akbar. Look how shaitan can put a person from high position to the lowest position. What happened? They found him guilty and they decided they would kill him. He has to be killed. They set up a date and the time that they would kill him. Shaitan came again. Allahu Akbar. At the time that they said and they would kill him, he was tied. The legs and the hands were tied up. That the final decision made this time. Then Shaitan came to his ear. Ya Barsisir, would you like my help? Would you need. Do you need any help? Allahu Akbar. He said, yes. If I can get any help, yes, I will. And that is also one of the lessons. You know, one of the most critical time is the time of death. And that is why, you know, Imam Ali said, Ya Ahla Hamdan man yamut minkum min mu'minin aw kafirin yarani kubula. Every person, before the death, you have to see Imam. Whether you like it or not, Imam is going to come. For the Shia of Al Bayt is coming to aid and help them. Because Shaitan comes there too. That is the most important time. So, Barsisya, 
as he was about to be killed, Shaitan came in. And guess what did Shaitan come now for? Shaitan came and he said to him, Ya Barsisya, if you need any help, let me know, I'll help you. Barsisya said, all I need is if you can help me and save my life. Shaitan said, I'll do it. That's easy. But you have to do one thing for me. What is it? I said, Ya Barsisya, I want you to do sajda for me. Do sajda for me. Then Barsisya said, what are you talking about? That's too dumb. My hands are tied, my legs are tied. I can't do such a thing. How can I do such a thing for you? He said, I understand now. Even if you bow your head down with the knee here, that you bow in for shaitan, I take that as a such a thing. Allah. That my said, okay, if that is okay, I will do it. Then he said, okay, I'll bow down. He made his knee here, I'm bowing down, I'm doing such a thing for shaitan. And he did. Dan, can you save me? So Dan said, no, that's part one. There's part two that you have to do. What is it? He said, now I want you to denounce Allah. Say, there is no God. As soon as you say, that's said, I'll save you and you will be out of here. Allah. Then Barsisya said, there is no God. And I believe there is no creator of this universe. And look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. As soon as he mentioned there is no God, he denounced Allah. At that moment, they put the rope on his neck and they pulled and he died. Allah Akbar. And the story, as I told you, is in Surah Al Hashr. It's just two ayahs, but the whole story is what I just told you. In Surah Al Hashr. So after he got pulled, and he was dying, Shaitan said, I'm not, I can't do anything, I'm sorry, I'm gone. And he left him, and he left Kafir. And Allah mentioned the story. The example of people who started their life very good, believing men or believing women. They were pious, they were serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what happened? Before the end of their life, Allah said, قَالَ لَهُ الشَّيْطَانَ أَقْفُرْ Shaitan told him, disbelieve. Denounce Allah. فَلَمَّا كَفَرْ When he listened to Shaitan and he disbelieved, قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيُّهُمْ مِنْ Shaitan told him, I'm far away. I denounce you too. And that is one of the things we have to understand. That in our aqidah as a followers of Ahlul Bayt, you are allowed if you are put in the situation of life and death, you are allowed to say bad things about the Prophet, about Ahlul Bayt, but you're not allowed to denounce them. Even that will cost your life, it's haram to denounce them. Yes, you can say something that is not, is not appropriate about them. And it's mentioned in the Quran in regarding to one of the components of the, uh, one of the, components of the Prophet. Right? And Allah mentioned it when he came and they were, he was forced to say bad things about the Prophet. He came and told the Prophet, Ammar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an ayah about him. Allah told the Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I am the witness of the heart of Ammar that whatever he said, he didn't mean it. And Allah said, Illa man ukriha wa kalbuhu mutma'innum bil iman. He said what he said, but his heart was filled with the Iman with Allah and the Prophet. Now, this man, Barsis here, he died as a kafir. He started as a man of God. But what happened at the end? He died as a kafir. And Quran calls him kafir. That is one example from the Quran. Another example in the Quran is a Samiri. You know, Samiri, when you read in Surah Taha, Allah talks about him too. Very pious man too to begin with. What happened? Quran tells you about him. This Samiri was also one of the pious men at the time of Musa alayhi salam. To the point where some of us read, they said when Jabra'il comes to Musa in the form of human, nobody could see him. But Samiri could see Jabra'il. To the point, someday Jabra'il came on the horse 
asked the Jabra'il was coming to meet with Musa alayhi salam. This time when he saw the horse of Jabra'il, and he saw one of the footprints, and he took that footprint. But what happened to this Samiri? Samiri, who's supposed to be one of the God-fearing men, one of the pious men, what happened to him? When Prophet Musa السلام, went to receive revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the time Musa came, he changed and he became what? He became a kafir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about him in the Quran of Allah. He started as a pious man, but he died as a kafir. And Quran talks about him. When Musa came and he asked him, as to why did you change? After years and years of my service, trying to guide Bani Israel, make sure that they are on the right path. Now you came and you turned them in 40 days of my trip. Then Musa السلام, said, فَإِنَّ لَكَ أَن تَقُولَ لَا مِسَاسِ Musa cursed him and asked Allah to punish him. How did Allah punish him? Allah punished him by any time a person comes close to him, he becomes scared and he feels heat when he can't stand anybody next to him. He becomes a man who cannot socialize. And he left the city. He went and lived in desert by himself and died alone. He started as a nice man, as a pious, and died a kafir. That is one example. Another person in the Quran also who started, didn't start as a good. Because I'm just wanting to understand the importance of good ending. Sometimes we worry about the beginning, but not worry about the end. And it's very important to always think about the end. That's why in Surah Ali Imran, Allah is talking to us. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatik wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimin. Allah said, fear Allah through fear and not die unless you are a true Muslim. Because you can be born Muslim. You can be raised Muslim. But not necessarily you might die a Muslim. A lot of people, we think because I was born a Muslim, I am guaranteed to heaven. No, that's not the case. And a lot of people, because I love Ahlul Bayt, I'm guaranteed. No, it's not a, that is not the case. The action is also required. You go back to the hadith and the Quran. Quran tells us there are people, Allah talks about them. They have connections, but the connection didn't benefit them. One example, you go to the Quran, Allah talks about Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. One of the Ulul Azm. He had a son, but the son was not practicing. When the son was drowned, Musa Prophet Nuh alayhi salam turned towards Allah. He said, Ya Rabbi, inna bni min ahli, wa inna wa'daka al-haq. He said, my son is one of those who got drawn. And I know your promise is true. Ya Allah, is there any way you can do something for my son? Allah said to Nuh alayhi salam, inna hu laysa min ahli. It's not your father. <laughs> ya Nuh, don't even speak to me about those children, those people who got drawn. Allahu Akbar. That is Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Sometimes a person has a connection with the bad people, but they end up being among the people of heaven. One example is Asiya bintu Muzahim, the wife of Pharaoh. Her husband was one of the worst people you can ever think. And I'm giving an example. In case I'm thinking my father is an Adam, and I don't have to worry about me doing good, he will take care of me. No, is in this one of the examples. Some people they say, no, my husband is an alim. My husband is this, right? Now look at the example. As he had been to Muzahim, her husband was kafir, Firaun, the worst man Allah ever mentioned in the Quran, who claimed so many things. And he used to say, ah, all the rivers of Egypt, they are all under my control. And Allah said, I'm going to show you how powerful you are. The water that's are under your control, I'll run them on your head to see what would you do. Then he went to the river. Allah made the river to go over him, and he was not able to do anything, and he was drowned. Right? Now his wife, Asiya, went to Muzahim. What happened to her? This Asiya, she was not. She was a believing woman, 
When Fir'aun found out that she was also believing in Musa alayhi salam, he decided to kill him. And Quran mentioned, you know, Fir'aun, la'anatullah alayhi, he had his own way of killing people. And Quran mentioned in Surah Al-Fajr, وَفِرْعَوْنَ ذِي الْأَوْتَانِ He used to have four pillars. Right? Four pillars put, and then he tied the people to, the, to, to those pillars. One hand to one pillar, one hand to the other, and one leg to other pillar, and then the other leg to another pillar. And then they'll start punishing the person. Sometimes what happened? He brings the hot water pouring on those people, those innocent people. Right? And his wife was one of them. When he finally found that Asiya believed in Musa, he started to warn her. And she said, no, I believe in him as a messenger and the prophet of Allah, and there is no going back. And he said to her, either you go back and denounce him, and you stay with me as a wife, and you have all this beautiful house and the power that you have, or you will be killed. He said, no, I don't want the house. Allah wants then Pharaoh made the house to be open to show us, look, look at the house. As a face lady, you have everything you want in the house. Servant, everything that you can think of. But look at Asi, what did she say? And Quran mentioned her too. Qala Rabbi ibnili indaka laytan fil jannah. Ya Allah, he's talking about this house. I want another house, not this house. Which house is that? He said, I want the house in the heaven. وَنَجْنِي مِنْ فرعون. Save me from Pharaoh. وَعَمَلِ And his action. وَنَجْنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ And save me from the tyrant people of Pharaoh. Allahu Akbar. Before Pharaoh came to punish Asia, Allah told the angel of death, يَا مَلَكِ الْمَوْتِ Take his, take her life. So she doesn't even feel any pain that Pharaoh wants her to go through. So by the time Pharaoh came in army to punish her, she was already gone. <coughs> it's just the body, they were punishing, but she already gone. But the point is this that this Asiya bin to Muzahim, she was linked to a man who was tyrant, but she ended up having a heaven from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the action. That is the importance of good ending. Now, some people we think that because I have this, I have that, so I don't have to strive, I don't have to work hard. No, in Islam. You have to work hard as the companions of Imam Hussein. Some of them started good and end good. Some of them started good and they did not end good. And the reason why I want us to, to make to take this as a take-home message, because this test is coming on us too. Our 12th Imam is coming. When he comes, some of us who have started good and will end good and some of us started good but will not end good right now at the time of imam hussein alayhi salam there are so many people who were sending letters to imam hussein alayhi salam inviting imam hussein to come to kufa imam hussein alayhi salam he wanted to make sure that those people are really telling the truth and they want him to come as a leader so what did he do imam hussein alayhi salam chose one of his representatives one of his ambassadors, Muslim Banaqeel. And he told him, Ya Muslim Banaqeel, I want you to go to Kufa and take care of those people and make sure that whatever they're talking about, they're telling the truth. Muslim Banaqeel, he took his everything that he could and he left Medina. And Muslim Banaqeel was for people from Medina. He left Medina going to Kufa. And Muslim Banaqil never stopped to ask Imam Hussein, what do I need to do? Why do I have to go? He surrendered to his master immediately asked Imam Hussein asked him. And never stopped to question him, why? Why me? Why do I have to? He immediately surrendered to his master. And he took his belongings and he started his way towards Kufa. He got to Kufa. And he settled in the house of one of the companions of Imam and one of the friends as well. And his name is Tawa. What happened? The narration said when he got there and he stayed with him, 
and he was there and the first thing they went to the masjid and he was holding the letter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and in the masjid he read the letter to the people and everyone in the masjid was crying because whatever he was reading is like they were listening to the voice of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and after the letter every one of those people came and gave their pledge to Imam Hussein but listen careful what did all of them keep their pledge or they changed? That's the topic. Some of them who came and gave their pledge, some of them stayed until the last moment. And some of them did not take their pledge to Imam Hussain. What happened? After they came and gave their pledge to Imam to, to Muslim Bunaqil, immediately Muslim Bunaqil wrote a letter to his master, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and gave to one of the caravan who was heading towards Medina. And he told Imam Hussain, he said, hurry up to Kufa, everyone that I met is always, they are all ready for you, Imam Hussain. By receiving that letter from Muslim Bunaqil, Imam Hussain gathered himself and his family, heading where? Heading Kufa. As soon as he gathered his family, a lot of people came and said, no, don't go. One of them is Ibn Abbas. He came and said to Imam Hussein, don't go to Kufa, stay here. We will intervene between you and Allahu Akbar with Yazid. And we make sure that nothing happened. He would not touch you. He would not do anything. And as Ibn Abbas was holding the horse of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there was a lady, Karima to Ahlul Bayt, Zainab alayhi salam. She heard Ibn Abbas is telling Imam Hussein not to go to him. And she said to him, Ya Ibn Abbas, are you telling our master, Imam Hussein, to leave us here and go to Kufa alone and not to go with us? He said, impossible. You know why? Because Imam Hussein alayhi salam and Imam Amir al muminin before the day of his death, he already told Zainab to take care of her brother, Imam Hussein. So it's impossible for her to let her brother to go to Kufa by himself and not with her. So what happened? Imam Hussein took all those children and his family heading towards Kufa. On his way, he had the message that Muslim Banaki was there. And the first thing he did was to bring the two children of Muslim to him. And he started rubbing on their head. And they knew they were smart children. Immediately they asked Imam Hussein alayhi salam, I saw you treating me like you treat the orphans. Did my father die? Imam Hussein said, no, I'm your father. That was a way to tell them that your father is killed. Your father is shame. After that, Imam Hussein alayhi salam did not stop. He proceeded on his way to where? To Karba, to Kufa. On his way? That was when the enemies of Al Bayt they stopped Imam Hussein with the leadership of Hurra bin Yazid al Rayahi. And when they met him, what happened? Imam Hussein alayhi salam gave them everything. But before then, when Muslim Banaqeed was in Kufa and he gave all the pledges, the same people who gave him pledge, they started leaving him one by one. Why? Because they had a message from Ibn Ziyad that Ibn Ziyad said to them, anybody who stays with Hussein, we will bring the soldiers from Sham and all of them will be killed. And they started leaving Imam, uh, they started leaving Muslim Banaki one after the other. From thousands, they started to drop to hundreds. From hundreds, they started to drop to few numbers. Until one night of Salat and Isha, Muslim Banaki led people like 40, 50 people. By the time he finished the Salat al Isha, nobody was behind him. Allah They gave their pledge, but they didn't stick to their pledge. They started with a good, but they did not end with good. So what happened? Muslim Bunaqil left the masjid. And those days, the Kufa is not like today. People who have been to Kufa, Kufa is not a big city. There is streets, there is houses, everything. Back in those days, it's nothing but desert. And Muslim Banaki started living, going from one place to another, looking for shelter, and there is no place he could go. As he took left and right, up and down, he couldn't find a place to go. 
Muslim Bunaqil, he then found a house where he went there and he sat in front of that house, hoping for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lady came and she opened the door. When she opened the door, she saw a Muslim Muslim was sitting in front of her door. She asked him, why are you sitting at my door? Muslim said, I am thirsty if I can get water. She said, okay, she brought him a glass of water. Muslim Bunaqil drank the water and he was still sitting at the door. The lady came back and she saw him sitting and she told him, yeah, Muslim, yeah man, new man, because she didn't know who he was in the beginning. So she told him, I don't allow you to sit here. You ask for water, I give you, please leave. Muslim Bunaqil said to him, I am a stranger in this city. I have no family in I have nowhere to go. Is there any way I can be left to stay here for one night? And I'll find my way tomorrow. Allah. This is just to practice the order of his master, Imam Hussein. This Muslim, he was invited into the house. The woman gave him a room to stay in that room and do whatever he thinks he wants to do so he can have his own privacy. Muslim Bunaqil was in that room doing his ibadah, but unfortunately the man, the woman, she had a son who was not a good son. He came and he found, she, and he, he found his mother was going to Muslim Bunaqil, giving food, water, whatever he needs. Then she asked, who is in that room? Why are you going back and forth to that room? She said, because I am a guest. Who is a guest? You know, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, in the Ayyum Arafah, he mentioned one important message, which is a lesson for all of us. Man dalladhi faqada man wajada, wa man dalladhi wajada man faqada. He said, he who has you, he didn't lose any. You have Allah, you didn't lose any. But if you don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's say you have everything in this world, I say you have nothing. And when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have everything. Muslim Bunaqil, he realized on that day that he has Allah, he has everything. So what happened? When they came, Muslim Bunaqil didn't surrender. He got himself ready. He went out. And the people started fighting him. Muslim Bunaqil fought them as they could until the men they realized that this man cannot be defeated. Allahu Akbar. Wallah, if you have Allah, you have everything and you have nothing to worry about. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَبِيرَةٍ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ how many, how many few people were able to overcome and defeat the majority with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Majority is not the sign of success. Majority is not the sign of victory. The sign of victory is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslim Bunaqil, he went out and he fought them. As he fought those enemies, they finally realized, they said, look, this man, he has the blood of Abu Talib. And anybody who carries that blood and that gene cannot be defeated. So we have to find a strategy to defeat Muslim Banaqi. What happened? They came up with an idea. The only way we can defeat him, let's talk about peace. Okay. They told Muslim Banaqi, we want to make a peace. Muslim Banaqi said, okay, I'm all for peace. So he put his sword down. As soon as he put his sword down, he started to attack. Allah. Now look at these people who have no manners in Islam. They call themselves Muslims, but they have no manners. Muslim Bunaqil taught us in his life, in that short time that he came to Kufa, he taught us a lot of lessons. One of the lessons, before I come back to the point, Muslim Bunaqil, one time he made an agreement that he wants to kill Ibn Ziyad. So what happened? They decided to bring Ibn Ziyad to the house. They invited Ibn Ziyad and he had an agreement with his host that when Ibn Ziyad comes to the house, he will hide in the corner. 
and then they will sit down to him and he will come and strap in his yard and they will be he will be killed and that will be the end of all the big men what happened they they go they went for that uh, with, they went with that plan they invited Ibn's yard and he came to the house they were sitting and they started signaling Muslim Munafim to come and finish the job and kill Abdullah ibn Ziyad. He didn't show up. He kept signaling, he kept signaling. He didn't come out. Allahu Akbar. Until Ibn Ziyad himself fell in danger and he left. When he left, they came and asked Muslim Munafim, why didn't you attack him? Why didn't you come up into the plan? Why didn't you kill this man? You know his answer? He said, he said, I didn't come out because I remember one of the sayings of the Prophet. What was it? He said, I heard the Holy Prophet say, Al Mu'min la yabdu. Al Mu'min, a believer, will not deceive. What do you mean? He said, We invited him for dinner. And he came for that dinner. And then we go ahead and attack him and kill him. He said, that is not the teachings of Islam and I will that. I wouldn't do that. If we want to fight him, we have to let him know that we are going to fight you and fight him as men. If he wins, that's fine. If we win, that's fine. But we're not going to bring him here in the name of dinner and then attack him. Allah Akbar. Look at his character towards the enemies, right? Now look at those enemies, their character towards him. When they invited him to the peace, and he heard the words, and he thought they were men of the words, he put his sword down. Now they started attacking Muslim Banafi. The first attack came and cut his lips. And by that time, Muslim Banafi was very weak and tired. One man fighting many men. And he was as thirsty as he could be. And he told the enemies, Can I have a glass of water? He said yes. He brought him water. When he put the water at his mouth to drink, the entire water turns to blood. He becomes nudges. Can you throw it? He brought him the second one. The same thing happened. He brought him the third one. The same thing. He wanted to bring him the fourth one. He said, no, don't bring the fourth one. I know. I have no share from this water anymore. Don't worry about it. He said, okay. They took Muslim Munaqeen as a prisoner to work to the castle of Ubaidullah Abu Ziyad. As soon as they walk in into the castle, Ubaidullah Abu Ziyad was looking at him and he was smiling. And guess what? Muslim Munaqeen was crying. And when he saw Muslim Munaqeen was crying, he thought Muslim Munaqeen was crying because he was caught. He thought Muslim Munaqeen was crying because he will be prisoned, he will be killed, he will be tortured. Then he said to him, Ya Muslim, people like you shouldn't be crying. You came, you wanted to become a leader. You came, you were fighting for power, for position. Why are you crying? You know, Muslim Barakal said, Wallahi, I'm not crying because you're going to kill me. No, I'm crying because I'm worried about a position of power. Of power. He said, I'm crying because of Imam Hussein Ali Hussein. Allah Akbar. Why are you crying about Imam Hussein for? He said, I'm crying because I've already told him to come. And you know, those days, it's not like today. Today, you can text message. You can email. You can phone call. You can have many ways to, con to contact with people. Back in those days, the only way they can connect with people or communicate when people are far is the only way is through caravan. People who travel from one place to another. And there is not enough time for Muslim Bonafil to get the message to Imam Hussein not to come. He said, that was the reason why I'm coming. Then Muslim Bonafil was told by Ibn Ziyad, I said, let me tell you, you are, you, are, you are Muslim. Now that you are now in my custody, you can say anything you want to say. You can write anything you want to write. But I want to tell you, you will not going to get out of this place unless you're dead. Allah Akbar. So go ahead and write your word. Muslim Bunafil said, because in the gathering there was Umar bin Sa'ad. 
He said, can I talk to Omar Musa? I want to talk to him in private. Omar Musa didn't want to go. He said, no, I don't want to talk to him. Every day I told him, go and listen to him. Maybe he wants something from you. He said, okay. They had a corner. Muslim Munafiq said to him, I have three wish, three will that I want you to honor, if you will. He said, yes, what are they? He said, number one, and the most important one, I want you to do whatever it takes to get to Imam Hussein and give him the message not to come to Kufa. That is my priority. That is one. Number two, he said, I want you to pay a loan I took from Medina to come here, hoping that I will go back and pay the loan. Please pay the loan on my behalf. Is it okay? What is the third one? He said, the third one is, I want you, Muslim, I, I, I want you, Omar bin Sa'id, to make sure that after I get killed, I want you to wash my body and make sure that I get the proper burial. That's all I ask. Allah. Then after that, Omar bin Sa'id went and he was telling over Ibn Ziyad and they were laughing. He said, I can tell you what Muslim Muratim was. What is it? One, don't tell Imam Musa. Tell Imam Musa not to come. Two, make sure that you pay his loan. Three, make sure that his body is washed. He said, that's what he asked for. And they were sitting there laughing at Muslim Banafi. Allah. But you know, Muslim Banafi, one of those companions who started good and ended with good, as we mentioned. He started with the faith as he's supposed to be as a mu'min. And his ending also was a good ending as well. And that is one of the teachings of Ali Bay. One of the lessons of Karbala. That Muslim Munaqeel, he looked at Ibn Ziyad. And he said to Ibn Ziyad, he said, I know you are going to kill me. But do whatever you want to do. But I want you to remember that a day will come that this world will be existing without you as it existed with the tyrant before, and today they are history. They were leaders who were tyrant. They lived. They did everything they could, and today they all are history. He said, and they will come, you will be a history too, as they were. That is when he told, I want to be brought also his host. They brought the host out, Allah Akbar. And he was tied up too. The narration stated that the first thing Ibn Ziyad asked, he asked to be the both of them to be tortured. Allah. You know, in Islam, we have something we call how to treat a prisoner. Wallah, if you want to know the crime of Bani Umayyah in Islam, there is no crime like the crime of Bani Umayyah towards Ali Bani Ali No crime. You go, go out throughout the history, Check from Adam up to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. No person was ever been taken as a prisoner. And he went through like the way Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam went. Imam Hussein and his companion. You know, in Islam, when you take a prisoner, any prisoner, Muslim, non-Muslim, there is an Islamic teaching how to treat a prisoner. And let me share with you some of them. Number one, one of the ways to treat a prisoner in Islam you are not allowed to humiliate a prisoner just because they're a prisoner. No. Even though they're a prisoner, they deserve a respect. And you go to Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know, when he captured Ibn Muljim al Muradi, what did he tell his children? Imam Hassan Hussein. He said, My children, he said, I want you to treat him very well. Whatever you eat, make sure I eat the same. No, you're teaching brother. Where can you find this teaching in anywhere in the world? That a prisoner, he was being treated the same way like anybody else. Imam Ali alayhi salam told his children, he said, I want you to treat him like, like your soul. He said, At imuhu mimma ta'kulun, wasquhu mimma tashrabun. He said, whatever you drink, make sure he has the same. Don't treat him because he's a prisoner, different, you know. And Imam Ali said, ana shufi, if I am if I'm cured and I'm not, I didn't die from this event, he said, I will take care of it. But if I die, he said, I want you to strike him one strike like he did with me. That's it. And I'm not allowing 
going to go around killing people just in the name that my father, Imam Ali, is going to go. No. That is how to treat a prisoner. Number two, when you capture a prisoner, if that prisoner also it, it comes from a respected family, Islam said he or she should be treated with respect of God, with honor and dignity. And go back to the history. In one of the battles when the prophet captured prisoners, there was a lady. Her father was not a big man, but he was a very, very kind and generous man. She came to the prophet. She said, Ya Rasulullah, my father was a generous man. He used to slaughter every animal that he has just to feed the poor people. And my father will give the last penny that he has for any need. He was very generous, very kind, very compassionate. The prophet said, well, Allah, I wish your father, I live to see him. But what can I do for you? A prisoner. Then she said, Ya Rasulullah, because of my father's kindness, I want you to free me. Allah Akbar. The prophet told her, I said, I free you. Go. She left. She came back later. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I still have some prisoners there too, my family. The prophet said, yes, where do you want? She said, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to free them too. The prophet said, take them and free them. She took those prisoners and left them. Allah Akbar, because of her father. That's number two. When you come to a prisoner, you're supposed to treat them with respect. Not because they're prisoners, you have to treat them the way you want. No, it's something you are not allowed to do that. Number three, when you capture a prisoner, you are not allowed to let them see their dead people or people who will cause them to be sad and sorry. And that happened also in one of the battles with Bilal al Habish. Right? And the battle, they said, when the Prophet وسلم, was standing far away, he heard one of the prisoners, a woman, she was screaming. And the Prophet asked, Why is this lady screaming? They say, Ya Rasulullah, she was forced to pass by one of a relative who got killed. The Prophet asked, Who did this? They say, Ya Rasulullah, it's one of the companions, Bilal al Habish. He was just taking her to where they keep the prisoners. And by mistake, she saw one of her dead family. And that's why she was screaming. She was screaming. You know what the Prophet said to Bilal al Habish? Say, Ya Bilal, Hal nuzi'at min kar rahma? Don't you have mercy? Don't treat the prisoner this way. When you see that this is a relative, don't let her see the dead families of her. She deserves better than this children. Right? That is how Islam said you and I should treat a prisoner who's not even a Muslim. Right? Now, on top of that, now a prisoner, a person we captured, a non Muslim, a kafir, we killed him. Islam said you should respect their body. Right? Even though they come with respect their body. And you see, Imam Ali did the same thing with whom? For the Amr al Wud al Amr. Right? When he killed them and he left a gold and diamond on his body, the family of the deceased, Amr ibn Abdul Wud al Amri, when they came and they saw the dead body of their brother was still in there and nothing was touched. You know what they asked? They said, Who killed this uncle? This brother. They said, Ali. Wallah, they went to Imam Ali, he says, Wallahi anta katilun kuf'un kareem. So you are a killer who is a generous killer. So how was he generous? Because among the Arab back in those days, when you kill somebody, you are allowed to take everything. Valuable things, you are allowed to take it. Imam Ali, after he killed this man, who was an enemy of Allah, enemy of Islam, and the Prophet said about him on that day, he said, Baraz al-Islam kulluh ala shirki kulluh. The Prophet compared him, Amr ibn Abdul al Amri, as a complete disbelief, and Imam Ali was represent complete Imam. But when Imam Ali killed him, he didn't take anything. Muslims, they came and said to Imam Ali, Ya Ali, hold, take everything. Because in Islam, there's a rule. Man katala katilan fala musalam. When you kill an, an, uh, an enemy, you're allowed to take anything valuable from him. You know what Imam Ali said? He said, no, I'm not going to take anything. Why? He said, Li'annahu kabir kabir. 
no matter what bad he is, he is the leader of people. And I do not want to disrespect him on Facebook. Allahu Akbar. Wallah, this is Adil Bayani himself. He said, no. Even though he's a kafir, even though he came to fight us, and we were able to kill him, but we're not going to touch anything from him. We leave him. Right? Now go back to those enemies of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. Right? Muslim Munaqeel, what happened? Ibn Ziyad, he said, after we kill him, Ibn Ziyad, after, Ibn Ziyad, after we kill Muslim, as said, not only we are not just going to disrespect him, we will disrespect his dead body. What happened? He told his, uh, his army. He said, after you killed him, I want you to drag his body. And he was saying, Allahumma iftah baynana wa bayna qawmi da'awna. Ya Allah, you be the judge between us and the people. Those who invited us. Those who brought us to this place. Invited us to come and take the pledge for their master and for their imam. And now they turn away from us. Allah Akbar. Imam was on his way, coming after they gave their pledge to him, and they told him to come. 4,000 letters Imam Hussein gathered in few months from the people of Kufa, and because of that, he sent his ambassador Muslim Bunaqil. Now those people, Muslim Bunaqil came, and now they turn away from Muslim Bunaqil. Now what happened, the narration said, Muslim Munaqil was taken to that custody. After Ibn Ziyad given order that he wants Muslim Munaqil to be killed. Muslim Munaqil was taken to the high top of the building. And look at the teachings of Islam. And the message that we want to learn. He started as a good servant of Allah. And he never changed because of the situation or the surrounding of that he went to. He still maintained his faith, his iman, his dignity till the last minute of his life. Muslim Bunaqil was taken to the high position of the building. He was standing there. The narration said the enemies of Allah, they started to strike the neck of Muslim Bunaqil. When they struck the neck of this young man, Muslim Bunaqil, before they struck him, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. I bear witness there is no God but Allah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. While he was saying this word, they struck his neck. The head was falling on the ground. They pushed the body of Muslim to follow the head coming on the ground. Allah. Muslim Bunakil, the representative of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. What was his crime? His crime was because he came in, in obedience to his master, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. That is why he has to be killed by these enemies. Muslim Bunakil was struck and he killed, they killed him. When his body fell on the ground, they didn't leave Muslim Bunakil alone. Then they followed the body and the head together. They brought the camels around the body of Muslim Munaqeel, Allahu Akbar. They tied the camels with the body of Muslim Munaqeel. And they started pulling those bodies along with those camels, along with the ways and the, and the path of Kufa, and in the market of the Kufa, and telling people this is the body of Muslim Munaqeel. Those who came to, to support Imam Hussein, this is how the end will be. And they were dragging the body of Muslim Bunaqil all over the city of Kufa until after all the surrounding and all the rounds, they left the body of Muslim Bunaqil. Allahu Akbar. Inna inna wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Wa sayalamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun kalabin yanfalibun. Wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying.